Okay, so last time uh, we proved the transfinite recursion theorem. Uh, I had to rush the proof towards the end, so I was a bit sloppy, but uh, I don't want to go back to proof because it's going to cost us a, a lot of time. So if you're not feeling comfortable about that, you can read in, in notes or we can discuss it after the class during the hours, the proof. Let me give another variation of the transfinite recursion theorem. The transfinite recursion theorem, let's say a variation. When I say a variation, it's, it simply means this will be a similar statement, but a different one, which can be proven with a proof similar to that of the transfinite recursion theorem. So it says the following. Let's say that you have three class functions. OK. Then. There is a unique class function this is supposed to be f phi 3 obviously f phi 1 f phi 2 f phi 3 and there is a unique class function f psi such that the following happens So f psi f0 equals f phi1 of 0. So f phi1 tells you what to do at the ordinal 0. f phi2 tells you what to do at successor ordinals by looking at what you have done so far. And let's see. Yeah, the th for all gamma and the third class function given to us, f phi three, tells us what to do at the limit stages. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm gonna make a change over here. For all limit ordinals gamma and let's make this let's change this to I mean this is also correct like this variation is also correct but I don't want that I want this epsi of alpha for all alpha good so let me go over this this variation simply says if you give me three class functions then I can find another class function which does the following. The value of this class function is determined, at zero is determined by the value of this first one at zero. Okay, so this guy tells me what to do at zero. The second guy, f phi 2, tells me what to do at successor ordinals by looking at only what I have done at the previous stage. I mean, over here, I can put this as well. There is such a class function as well, but this, this is the same as the transfinite recursion theorem we proved last time. So just to get a slight variation, I'm going to do this. So uh, the value at S alpha is determined by the value at alpha. This is like my recipe. This tells me what to do, OK? This is uh, the recursive rule that I write down for successor stages. And the third one. The third class function is my recipe at limit stages. Basically, what do I mean? The value of my class function at a limit ordinal is determined by its value up to that point, OK? So you just look at what you have done so far, and this guy, f phi 3, tells you what to do based on this. Now, we're not going to prove this. The proof is very, very similar, so you should just take this fact Granted, okay, the proof is exactly like the proof of the transfinite 
recursion theorem, or you can try to prove this from, the, from that one, okay? That's also possible. That's actually easier. Now, yeah. Over here, this means that the value of f psi at alpha. So I plug in alpha to f psi. Over here, I restrict f psi to alpha. What this means is I'm looking at the set of values of this guy where beta is an alpha. Okay, I need not just that, I also have beta here. So, this restriction is simply the set. This is, um, oh, it's supposed to be gamma, obviously. They're both supposed to be gamma, thanks for that, yes. This is gamma. But do you understand the difference? Over here, I just restrict this function to this ordinal, whereas over here, I actually plug it in. Okay? Is this understood? You'll see an example, don't worry. Now, using this, let's define arithmetic on ordinal numbers. Okay. Let's start by defining addition. Or let me do addition and multiplication at the same time. Given an ordinal beta. We define addition and multiplication on ordinals as follows. So I'm just going to define addition and multiplication by transfinite recursion. So I should tell you, I'm going to use this variation, so I should tell you what to do at zero. So I'm just defining beta plus zero to be beta, okay? This is the, this is the part of, like this is the first bullet point order. I'll tell you what to do at zero. Now I'm going to tell you what to do at successor ordinals. In order to add a successor of alpha to beta, what you should do is you should just look at the value of beta plus alpha and take the successor of that. So the value at S of alpha stage is determined by the value at the alpha stage. Now I should tell you what to do at the limit ordinals. So this is true for all alpha and if you're given a limit ordinal gamma, beta plus gamma is defined as the supremum of beta plus alphas where alpha is in gamma for all limit gamma. Okay? And multiplication is defined similarly. Beta plus zero is defined to be zero. Sorry, beta times zero is defined to be zero. Beta times S of alpha is defined to be beta times alpha plus beta. This is true for all alpha. And at limit stages, I again take supremums. beta times alpha and alpha is in gamma for all limit gamma, okay? Now, questions about the definition. Let's see some very basic examples down here. I don't want to go over to that board yet. So let's add one to omega. 
What kind of ordinal is omega? Limit or successor? Limit. So this is by definition supremum of 1 plus ordinals less than omega. What are the ordinals less than omega? Which ordinals are less than omega? Finite, finite numbers, like finite natural numbers, the elements of omega, exactly. 1 plus a natural number is another natural number. As you range, as n ranges on omega, you're going to get 1, 2, 3, 4, dot, dot, dot. You take the supremum of this set. What's the supremum of 1, 2, 3, 4, dot, dot, dot? It's omega. So 1 plus omega is omega in ordinal arithmetic. However, this is not omega plus 1. Because omega plus 1 is, let's see, omega plus successor of 0, then by the second bullet point, this is the same as successor of omega plus 0. But omega plus 0 is defined as omega, so this is successor of omega. OK? So, OK. So the point is, you see, these two bullet points, do you see the resemblance between additional natural numbers and additional ordinals? However, even though definitions like we are basically generalizing arithmetic on natural numbers, the actual arithmetical structure is very different. This, this operation is not commutative, for example. And the same is true for multiplication as well. Because if you try to calculate 2 times omega, this is supreme of 2 times n's. But if you just plug in natural numbers, you're going to get 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, that, that, that. If you take the supreme of these, this is going to be omega. However, this is not the same as omega plus 2, which is, let's see, let's understand what it is. Omega plus 2 is omega, I keep saying plus, omega times 2 is omega times successor of 1. By definition, this is omega times 1 plus omega. You can easily check that this is omega, okay? I have to do two more steps to get that this is omega. So omega times 2 is omega plus omega, okay? Questions? So, by definition, it looks like these operations are not commutative. Yes, they're not. But they're associative. We, we, we are going to prove that they're associative, but they're not commutative. I'm going to list all the properties of ordinal uh, arithmetic, okay? Don't worry. But they also look like equalities. It turns out that 1 plus omega equals omega, right? Yes. So, you can't do cancellations as well. That was my point. Like the definitions for additional multiplication, you see the resemblance between the definitions on natural numbers, right? For multiplication on natural numbers, we have these two. For multiplication on, sorry, for additional natural numbers, we have this two. But the actual arithmetical structure is very different. This operation is not commutative, and neither is this one. Okay? So there are some common points, there, but there are also. They're, they're also very different. I'm going to list the properties, don't worry. Now, let me define exponentiation. We next define exponentiation on ordinals. Given a non negative beta, we we define the exponentiation as follows. Beta to power 0 is 1. Beta to successor of, beta to the power successor of alpha is beta to power alpha times beta for all alpha, so, so I, 
the remaining case is the limit case. I know what to do at successor stages. I know what to do at zero. Now I should tell you what to do at limit stages. We're going to do the exact same thing. We're going to take supremums of all those ordinals of the four beta to the power alpha, where alpha is in gamma. Now, at this point, you will probably ask, why did I put this restriction? Why did I demand that beta is not zero? Because, let's see, I want zero to the omega to be one. what? What do you think this should be? This should be zero, right? However, if I didn't put this restriction, I use this definition, the following would happen. This would be the supremum of these guys, and I, when I define beta to the zero to be one, this also include this would also include the zero case, and you would get the numbers one, zero, 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 zero. When you take the supremum, you would get one. So for every limit ordinal, you would get zero to the gamma to be one if you included the case beta equals zero here. I don't want that. Some books might want this, okay? This is like a minor point. This is basically, you can do whatever you want for the specific case. So what I want to do is the following. And I don't want to extend this definition to the zero case because I don't want omega to the power, zero to the power omega to be one. So what I do is, for beta equals zero, I make it, def uh, I make it different definition. We define 0 to the power 0 to be 1 and 0 to the power alpha to be 0 for all alpha, okay? Except the 0 power, I define every power of 0 to be 0. That's that. Now, let's move to this board and Let me assign an exercise which is supposed to show you that the ordinal arithmetic is very, very different than the arithmetic on natural numbers. Okay. Show that there are ordinals alpha, beta, gamma such that no, I want this other thing. Okay, omega plus alpha should be alpha, omega times beta should be beta, and omega to the power gamma should be gamma. Show that there are such ordinals. Let me tell you why this is like, let me give you a hint. Let's try to construct this one. Zero, one, two, dot, 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 I have omega. Now I have successor of omega, successor of that, Instead of successor of omega, now I'm going to write, you remember I used to write successor of omega, successor of successor of omega here. Now that we define ordinal arithmetic, you can easily check that the next ordinal is omega plus 1, the next ordinal is omega plus 2, dot, 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 dot. We have omega plus omega, which is the same as omega times 2. Now let me continue. Omega times 2 plus 1, omega times 2 plus 2, dot, 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 dot omega times 2 plus omega, which turns out to be omega plus 3. Is it omega times 2 or 2 times omega? Omega times 2. 2 times omega is omega. I'm going to make a remark about that so that uh, this definition is, you, you adjust this definition. Just give me a moment, let me finish this. Now, pr pretend that I repeat this whole, like, you see, I, I, 
I have gone from omega to omega times 2, then to omega times 3. Pretend that I keep repeating this procedure. I go to omega times 4, dot, 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 omega times 5. And if I just repeat this whole procedure countably many times, I'm just going to go to omega times omega. And you can double check that when you plug in this ordinal over here, it's not going to change. One way to see this is the following. OK. Why did we introduce ordinals in the first place? What was the point of ordinals? It was to represent, come on, you remember this, strictly well-ordered sets, right? Every well-ordered set is isomorphic to an ordinal. OK. Let's say that this well-ordered set, this is some well-ordered set. It's a line, but imagine that this is a well-ordered set with some ordering. Pretend that this is isomorphic to alpha. Pre Let's say that this is a well-ordered set, and it's isomorphic to beta. What you do is the following. You take this well-ordered set, you put it there. You d define a new relation, and you declare all these elements to be bigger than all these elements. Basically, I'm taking two the strictly well-ordered sets, I'm putting these back to back. I'm adding these together. OK? Then this well-ordered set will be isomorphic to alpha plus beta. For example, you take a copy of natural numbers. This is a well ordered set, right? Natural numbers. You take a second copy of natural numbers. OK? Or if you don't like this, let me just create some, pretend that this is some sequence, and these are not natural numbers. Now this is well-ordered, this is well-ordered. I want to define a new well-ordering. I want to glue these together so that all these elements are bigger than all these elements. And the previous strictly, uh, the previous well-ordered structures are also there, OK? How does this look like? Which ordinal does this resemble? Omega plus omega, right? This is isomorphic to omega plus omega. So. Alpha plus beta represents the strictly well-ordered set, which is obtained by sticking beta to end of alpha. Now, you can guess that alpha times beta, of course, this has to be proven. And it's in your book, but I don't want to do that. You can guess that alpha times beta would be the following strictly well-ordered set. You take beta many copies of alpha together and stick them back to back. You have one copy of alpha, another copy of alpha, another copy of alpha. This, let's say this is the zeroth copy of alpha. This is the first copy of alpha. This is the second copy of, of alpha. You go up to beta. You take beta copies of alpha. And you put these sets back to back. OK? So omega plus omega is obtained, sorry, omega times omega is obtained as follows. I have this copy of omega. Let me denote this by a blue line. You put countably many copies, you put omega many copies of these blue lines back to back. Now this is a well-ordered set. I claim that it satisfies this. Why? If I had, if I take a copy of omega, and if I take omega plus omega and stick this to the end of omega, the does the, if you take omega and stick this guy to the end of this, does the ordinal you have change? No, this is still omega times omega. You still, omega, you still see omega copies of omega. 
So when you plug in omega times, when you plug in omega times omega over here, this will be satisfied, okay? So this is the ordinal you're looking for, but you can actually prove that this satisfies this using the definition. But I just want to simply show you that these definitions have, in a sense, geometric counterparts. I really shouldn't call them geometric, but I can't think of another word, okay? Alpha times beta is you take beta many copies of alpha, and these copies look like, simply they look like beta, and you stick these back to back. This is a new valuable set which is represented by alpha times beta. So omega many copies of omega, this is the ordinal omega times omega. And you can actually see it over here. One copy of omega, the second copy of omega, the third copy of omega, fourth copy, fifth copy. You see omega many copies of omega, okay? So this is omega, this is omega, this is omega, and so on. And addition is basically sticking these two back to back. That's that. Okay. Any questions about this? Now try to prove that there exists such ordinals using the definition, not just this geometric interpretation. So let me list some properties of the ordinal arithmetic only one of which will be proven in class because it, it takes a lot of time to prove this. Remember when I introduced the arithmetic on natural numbers, I simply said, I, we proved that like the addition is associative and I said, you can prove the rest by induction. We're gonna do the exact same thing. I'm just gonna prove one property and I'm gonna tell you that the rest can be proven just like this by transfinite induction. Now, I have to use my notes for this one because I have a lot of bullet points here for all alpha, beta, and gamma, we have the following. Now, ordinal addition is associated. This is the one I will prove in class. You can add ordinals from the left to both sides of an inequality, and it's not gonna be, it's not gonna flip or something. But only from the left. Now, that these operations are not commutative, it will be important here. Like, there's a reason I put this gamma on left. If you're dealing with Non-strict inequalities, you can also do this from right. Okay? You can also do this from right, but over here we have a non-strict inequality. Let's see. And I can do cancellations from... Which one? Wait, what? Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Indeed, I also don't want that. I. Well, yeah, I didn't want that. I want this. Yes. I have a lot of properties. I simply mixed something up. Sorry for that. Yeah, this one is true, yes. I, but I think I said the correct thing. You can do addition on right, but for non-strict ones. You can do cancellations on left, but you can't do cancellations on right because one plus omega is two plus omega because these are both omega. So you can't cancel from right, but you can cancel from left. And the reason for this is it's actually clear. What is this? What's the picture of this? You take a copy of gamma and you put a copy of alpha to the back. You take a copy of gamma, you put a copy of beta to the end. If these are isomorphic, 
There's only one isomorphism between them, and that isomorphism has to send gamma to gamma because it's going to send this initial segment to this initial segment. Therefore, it has to send this address of this to this. But then this is an isomorphism. If there's an isomorphism between two ordinals, then it's actually the identity. Okay? So pictorially, this should be clear. Anyway, multiplication is associative. And it distributes over addition, again, from left. Now that we are dealing with ordinal arithmetic, it is important where you put things, OK? You can't simply interchange stuff. This is, these operations are non-commutative. Now, If you want to multiply inequality with something from right, again, you have to be careful. A strict inequality, like if you just multiply both, side, both sides by gamma from right, this will turn into an less than or equal to. Because one is less than, or equal, one is less than two, but one times omega is two times omega. OK? So. When you multiply from right, you have to be careful. However, when you multiply from left, there's no problem. Now, you're not expected to know all of this, OK? And I don't know all of this off the top of my head. Just the basic ones, just like the, the, there's this distribution, and uh, these are associative, and you can't do certain cancellations. Knowing those sh uh, should be sufficient. So we have this usual property of exponentiation. We have these usual properties which we had for natural numbers. And let me finish listing these. And how many minutes do I have? So I want to finish the proof of the first one. So yeah, I think I should stop talking and simply write this. So yeah, this is the final one. So alpha is less than beta. As I said, I don't expect you to memorize these. If you're if you deal with ordinals sufficiently many times, then some of these you automatically like learn. But for example, if you told me whether this one, if you asked me whether this one was true or not, I would probably like hesitate for a second and think about this equality, what would happen to that. And then like, the point is, I don't know all of this. And so I don't expect you to do, know all of this off the top of your head. You always have your set theory books with you, you should, so that you can look these up, okay? If necessary, I don't think it will be necessary. Like in mathematical practice, most of the time you end up having to use cardinal arithmetic, which is different than ordinal arithmetic, okay? Which we're going to learn later. Now let me prove part A of this lemma. The point of me doing the proof of this part A is to show you what to do, how you prove the, like to, sh to show you how you prove these things. I'm just going to prove this one, but you should be able to prove the rest. Okay? So proof part A. How do you prove something about natural numbers? How do we prove that the addition of natural numbers is associative? Induction. How do you think we're going to prove that the ordinal addition is associative? Transfinite induction. Exactly. We prove this by 
transfinite induction on. Let's see, it is important to choose the correct variable. I'm going to do induction on gamma. Okay? So let alpha beta be ordinals. I fix alpha and beta. Then, let's see. I will first show that this claim is true for 0. If I add 0 to alpha plus beta, then by definition I'm going to get alpha plus beta. But beta is equal to beta plus 0 again by definition. So alpha plus beta plus 0 is alpha plus beta plus 0. So this identity holds for the case gamma equals 0. Thus, let me call this star. Star holds for gamma equals 0. Now, the successor stage. Assume that star holds for some gamma. What do we want to do? We wish to show that we wish to show that it also holds for S of gamma. Let's try this. Let me look at alpha plus beta plus successor of gamma. This is by definition successor of alpha plus beta plus gamma. But now by induction hypothesis, alpha plus beta plus gamma is alpha plus beta plus gamma. Okay? However, by the definition of addition, I can put the successor in the second variable. But again, if I use the definition, I can, if you just look at the definition, you'll see that this is the same as beta plus successor of gamma. Okay? So whenever this claim holds at an ordinal, it holds at the next ordinal. So I took care of the successor stages. Now the important part, limit stages. Assume that star holds for all delta less than gamma for a limit ordinal gamma. So we assume that this identity you want to prove holds below some limit ordinal. We wish to show we wish to show that star holds for gamma. We want to show that whenever it holds below a limit ordinal, it, it holds exactly at that limit ordinal. So let's do that. I'm going to need a lemma for this, which I'm going to prove next lecture, OK? So, alpha plus beta plus gamma. Gamma is a limit. So by definition, this is the same as supremum of alpha plus beta plus delta, where delta is less than gamma. Because star holds below gamma, alpha plus beta plus delta is alpha plus beta plus delta. Now I'm just going to try to trick you. What do I mean by this? I'm just going to write down some claims. 
like this. This is true as well. And this by definition is beta plus gamma. I mean, this looks very natural, right? Putting supremum in, that's fine. I mean, that should be fine. And when you look at this, you, this is a limit ordinal. You take the supremum of beta plus gamma. Delta is where delta is below is limit ordinal. So this is by definition beta plus gamma. And I prove what I want to prove. The only missing step is how do I pass from here to here? Why can I put, why can I take this alpha out? We're going to need a lemma for this, which I'm going to prove next time. Let x be a non empty set of ordinals. OK? And alpha be an ordinal. Let's say that I have a set of ordinals and I, I have some fixed ordinal. Then the following is true. Taking the supremum of alpha plus beta as where beta is in this set x is the same as adding supremum of x to alpha from right, OK? So this is the same, like, this is what allows me to move alpha out. Like, if you move this alpha plus out, alpha plus supremum of this, well, supremum of beta, where beta is in x, is literally supremum of x, OK? So this lemma tells me that I can just move this out, only from left, because we're working in a non-commutative setting, OK? And the following are also true. Let's see. I can do this for multiplication as well. OK? And I can do this for exponentiation, provided that you don't do something stupid and try to exponentiate uh, 1. If alpha is greater than 1, then this is true, OK? So let me put three bullet points. I'm going to prove the first one next lecture. I'm going to assign the other two as an exercise. So one way of stating this is, now the word is going to sound weird because I, didn't, I haven't introduced topology on this. But one way to state this is saying the following. Addition is continuous on the second variable. Multiplication is continuous on the second variable. What I mean by continuous on the second variable? Well, if these betas are approaching to some number, then alpha plus betas are approaching to alpha plus, alpha plus where betas are approaching. So in a sense, this is saying that like if you know uh, the sequ sequential characterization of continuity, this is in a sense saying that like the addition is continuous on the second variable. So is the multiplication and so is the exponentiation. Okay? And I can actually give a definite meaning to this by putting a topology on ordinals, and namely the order topology, which you might have heard. So I can make that statement, I, I, I can make the statement I just I had uh, said like pre precise addition, multiplication, and exponential addition, they're continuous in the second variable. Yes, it is a true statement. If you just give meaning to it, you should define what it means for such operations to be continuous. Well, there's the definition of continuity, but it involves topology, so I should put a topology on ordinals, which we can do, but we don't want to do that because we don't have enough time. I mean, I was planning to prove this today, but I we have minus two minutes, so we're going to do this next time. 
Okay? So, ordinal arithmetic is fun, okay? And next lecture, what we're going to do is we're going to prove this, and then we're going to introduce the counter normal form of ordinals. Let me tell you about counter normal form very quickly so that you'll understand why this is the fun part of the class. Well, the old parts of this class is fun, but this part is, in a sense, more fun. Because you're, you're going to see some, in a sense, number system which is different than those that you have seen up to now because the arithmetic structure is very different. Like, anyway, if I give you a number, let's say 13, you can write this in base. 10, right? Or let me give you another number, 123. Then this is going to be 2, and you will have 10 to the power 2 times 1. This is like, you can write any number in, a certain, in any base, actually. But we're, we're dealing with base 10 in real life most of the time because of historical reasons. So every natural number has some base 10 expansion. It turns out that every ordinal number has a base omega expansion. So whenever I have some ordinal, I will be able to write this guy as it's a base omega expansion. So it's gonna, it might look like this. I'm just making stuff up now. Plus 2 times 1 plus 7. I have powers of omega, omega to the power 0, omega to the power 2, omega to the power 5, dot, dot. These, has some, these have some coefficients. These are my coefficients. These are my digits, in a sense. And this is my base. So we will prove that every ordinal number can be written in base omega. And that representation of, of that ordinal number will be called its Cantor normal form. When you write ordinals in their Cantor normal form, adding them, multiplying them, exponentiating them, it's very easy. Why? What is this? Why? Why is this 17 n? You add these two, you add the digits corresponding to 10 to the power 0, you add the digits corresponding to 10 to the power 1. And if there are like, if you have carries like, I mean, if they exceed 10, you have a carry and so on, but those are like minor issues. We're going to have a similar situation, well, not that similar, but the point is you have an algorithm to add numbers, looking at their base 10 expansions. You will have an algorithm to add ordinal numbers just by looking at their Cantor normal form. When I give you Cantor normal forms, you should be directly able to add them and multiply them without doing all this supremum stuff and so on, okay? So our aim this week is to show that every ordinal has a Cantor normal form and then we want to prove certain things about Cantor normal forms, okay? So I'm just going to prove this very quickly at the beginning of the next lecture then we, we're going to move on to Cantor normal forms, okay? So I'll see you Thursday.